even though information is available, most of us don't seem to pay a whole lot of attention to it. And it's because the legacy of slavery, which involved the removal, certainly from the public eye, of any in-depth knowledge about who we are, was so successful that it captured the mind. It literally captured the mind, the enslavement of the mind, imprisoned motivation, imprisoned our perception, how we perceive the world, and put us in a web of an anti-self <coughs> mindset. I give high honors to all those good mores who sought to live a life of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. So much of what has motivated me to continue this work, this research, is because I know how vital it is for transforming how we see ourselves. We have gone through a great deal. In fact, some of you may be familiar with um, all the celebrations that occurred a couple of weeks ago, uh, or I should say commemorations. Uh, 1619, some of you may know what I'm talking about, right? 1619 is when the first Africans were brought to the British colonial Americas, ended up ultimately being the first servants, and then later the first slaves of African ancestry. The fact that so much of our history tends to focus on this idea of the legacy of slavery, I would argue is, is a huge part of why we're often so confused about our identity. Thank you. And one of the things that I was asked to do today is to talk a little bit about the history of the Moors in Spain. One of the things that I found in teaching them since 1992, first at the University in West Virginia, which is West Virginia University, and then ultimately Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, in the Department of History, Department of African American Studies, Department of Africana Studies, one of the things that I've noticed over the, the last 27 years is a reduction in awareness among many of our people regarding who we are. And it kind of ebbs and flows. There'll be periods where I'll see some students come through and they have this wave of knowledge, right? And they'll talk about people like Dr. Ben Yokani or Dr. Ivan Van Sur, um, or uh, uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, right? People who are making contributions to the areas of Africana history, or Africana studies. And I remember when I first started talking about the Moors while I was in graduate school at Temple, most people didn't know really the legacy of this chapter in human history. And for me, it never made any sense, given the fact that the Moorish contribution to Western civil civilization is arguably the single greatest contribution to the advances in the sciences and what we know as the university system at large. Because as you probably know, so much uh, usually uh, that comes from Western scholars is this idea that the intellectual tradition begins with the Greeks. Mm -hmm. 
right? So we talk about the Greco-Roman world, Greeks and Romans. The fact of the matter is the Greeks borrowed or stole, depending upon your perspective, much of their foundation in what we recognize as the sciences from ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. That's right. The Romans then took from the Greeks primarily, but the foundations of it are still coming out of Nile Valley civilization. A sidebar. When I first started studying more science, now mind you, I'm studying this as a historian, but I was intrigued that this organization that our prophet and founder, Noble Dralee, set up had us beginning, to a large extent, with Egypt. That, to me, was no coincidence. It implied that there was something there. The fact that no other organization and certainly not mainstream, you know, Sunni Islam, puts any focus on understanding Egypt and its role, was also something to go, wait a minute, let me take another look at what's going on over here. This community, these folks are emphasizing nationality, but they're also emphasizing knowing our history, know thyself, which is rooted in ancient Kemet. Has anyone here ever heard of the Cathars or the Albigenses? Good. The Albigensians or the Cathars was a Christian community in southern France that had been influenced by their contacts with Muslims in the East, most of whom were Moors, but they weren't all Moors, because they had also had contact with the people, and started to adapt their faith in Jesus in a way that was at odds with the Roman Catholic Church. Is anyone familiar with the Gnostics? Yeah. Okay. So those are familiar with the Gnostics, and you know, the Gnostics were about seeking knowledge through action. Right? It comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. The Gnostic community was one of the Christian communities right after the time that the man we know as Jesus walked the earth. And this Gnostic community, their interpretation challenged the Roman Catholic interpretation. They believed in reincarnation. Sound familiar? They believed in meditation. They believed in being vegetarians. They referred to the material world as having been usurped by a usurper god that they called Rex Mundi, which is just Latin for king of the world. Both women and men served as priests. Ultimately, they would be slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church, led at the time first by someone named Pope Innocent III. Initiated a massacre which started first in Bezea in southern France. And the 15th century is considered a, you might say, a, a red letter date in Moorish history, and not a good one. What happens in the 15th century? No. Well, the, the Spanish Inquisition is, is implemented, but there's something else that signals the decline of the Moors in Spain. 1491. Well, even before Columbus crossed the Atlantic, 1492 is when Granada, the last Moorish stronghold in Spain, falls. 1492. 
after it falls, that's when, right, as the brother said earlier, you then have Columbus now having the finance and the ability to sail to the Americas. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do it prior to that time. And it's no accident that he also has on board moriscos who have cartographical knowledge, meaning the knowledge of the maps. They know the trade routes. And they assist him in making it to the Indies. Some people say he was trying to get to the Indies as an Indian. No. I don't believe that. No. I don't believe that for a minute. He was bringing, well not, no, he was bringing, he brought on board his ship people who spoke Chaldean, Arabic, and um, Hebrew. Hebrew, right. No one on the ship spoke Hindi or Urdu. That's what you would need if you're going to India. To India. That's right. Plus, there were all kinds of secret maps that existed among merchants in Venice with connections to Prince Henry the Navigator, who was Portuguese as well, that told them, well, you know, the Moors have already gone to the Americas. They've already established settlements and contacts there. <clears throat> now we know how to get there as well, which is why Christopher Columbus, when he arrives in the West, in the Caribbean, talks about seeing people wearing Moorish attire on the island of Cuba. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff that is known by medieval historians, but never seems to make it out into the mainstream. But as soon as people started talking about this in the 90s, now you have more European and European-American scholars intrigued and turning to studying the history of the Moors and finding out just how profound the impact was. And much of it is coming out of uh, scholars from the University of Pennsylvania. But the fact that this renewed interest is there. One of my concerns is, is the next step then to try to whitewash the Moorish identity, right? The beauty of it is those scholars know that that would be very difficult. Some will try, but they know it's very difficult because that's why I said the, the art history. The artistic, the, the, the art history's evidence in terms of looking at the representations of who the Moors are and were is so entrenched in so many areas of Western history that you would catch him in a lie like that. I just recently, I was preparing a lecture for one of my classes in, in US history, American history, and I was talking about someone named Ganibal Abram, who was actually the great grandfather of Alexander Pushkin. I don't know if anyone knows who Alexander Pushkin was. Yep. But he's right, he's known as the father of Russian literature. His great grandfather was referred to as the Moor of St. Peter. And a book was written in the 19th century, uh, uh, early, yeah, early 19th century called The Moor of St. Peter. And when you see him, here's this distinctly African man. They know that they can't hide what the phenotype would be of a Moor. So what they hope, meaning those who are trying to hide this truth, is that most people will still hold on to black and not go any deeper. They're hoping most people won't, or maybe they'll just go to Africa, but they won't start saying, well, we're, yeah, the Moors are Africans, but the Moors are Moors. The term Moor was used to identify people who look like us. We're living in an environment of weapons of mass distraction. 
those weapons of mass distraction is largely what keeps us from being able to be still a moment. As I say, catch your breath, think deep, it's it. not even just think deeply, be still, go inside. This brings us back around to this meditation aspect. Because when you do that, we already are told the nearest place that we meet a lot is in the heart. Uh -huh. But we're in an environment that's trying to keep us so frenetic. Frenetic. We get everything that we can't even pause for a minute to be still and figure out what's really going on. Right. And if there's anger there, track it. Why am I angry? I don't know if anyone has ever read the book by um, Tana Hesse Coates, Between the World and Me. It's an excellent book. It's an excellent book, in fact, if you're trying to get young Asiatic men to have a clearer understanding of what's going on in the world. I take off, as they say, my hat to Tana Hesse Coates because he's written something that essentially is compelling young men, mostly young men, to begin to think more deeply about what is motivating that anger. From there, then we can start talking to them about higher issues about who are you? Who are, do you know who the Moors are? Because you know, you have to, one of the things that I've learned to get people to come in, you have to meet them where they are at. Mm -hmm. And I can't just go to somebody's well, you, come on, you just join the temple. What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Join the temple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know about the temple. What are you talking about? <laughs> then again, well, why are you in it? Because you seem like you got some sense. Although I had one person say to me who didn't know anything about the real history of the Moorish Science Temple, I thought you were too smart to be in something like that. This was another academic who didn't know anything about the Moorish Science Temple other than a, a blip that they'd read in an encyclopedia that was written about 30 years ago. And I said to, well actually what I said was that was why I wrote the book meaning my book, why don't you read it? <laughs> right? Because it was written for people to understand the logic of the Moorish Science Temple as a movement. Drew Ali didn't pull this stuff out of his fez and make it up. <laughs> there is a historical precedent for everything that he laid out. And as I, you know, <laughs> have said earlier, if we ever needed a time to embrace what is contained in our Moorish literature, this is it. <laughs> if you look at what's happening in the world. But the problem, like I said, is so many of us are overwhelmed by the weapons of mass distraction. 